My name is Philip Zaplinski, Jr., MD, and I'll be discussing black, white, and gray, secrets of the trauma chest x-ray, when chest x-rays go bad. First, I want to discuss placement of ET tubes. ET tube placement can be verified by chest x-ray. And you can see here there's an ET tube coming in. There's a nice line that comes down that you can see that terminates right about here. I also notice that the right lung seems to be well aerated. However, on the left side here, you have a lot of lucency and brightness on the chest x-ray. And the ET tube, the goal is, is to have the ET tube at least one centimeter above the carina and no higher than the level of the suprasternal notch. And this is typically midway between the proximal clavicles in most people. In this case, this ET tube has gone farther down into the right main stem bronchus and you're aerating only the right hand lung. The left hand lung has atelectasis and obviously is not being vent ventilated correctly. This can be corrected by pulling back the ET tube, ventilating a couple times and then reshooting the chest x-ray and see if in fact it's been placed correctly. So placement of an NG tube can be verified clinically and medically using pH, a tumi syringe, auscultation of air into the stomach. However, a chest x-ray can verify placement just as well. And you can see here that the NG tube comes down the esophagus, crosses through the lower esophageal sphincter, enters into the stomach, and there's typically a little notch at the very end of the NG tube that allows you to notate where the NG tube was placed. And in fact, this NG tube looks like it's placed correctly. If there is doubt, you can do a lateral chest x-ray. And in fact, you can see that this NG tube is going down the esophagus. This is the trachea here. Coming down the esophagus, crosses the lower esophageal sphincter, and enters into the stomach. This is a well-placed NG tube. So what happens when it's not placed correctly? This NG tube appears to be coming down what might be the esophagus. However, you see it takes this diversion here off to the right-hand side. And in fact, this NG tube, as it was placed, went down the right main stem bronchus, probably because the patient coughed or has some anatomical variation that allowed that NG tube to bypass the epiglottis and come down into the lung here. And this tube needs to be pulled and placed correctly. Now, if you keep pushing, what could happen is, is that this NG tube can pass through the right main stem bronchus into the lung, through the lung, and then into the right-sided sulcus. This becomes a problem because now the NG tube has broke its way through the lung and is penetrating into the space between the diaphragm and the chest wall. This is dangerous and could cause a pneumothorax. And this NG tube obviously should be pulled and replaced. Rib fractures. These are often times very difficult to find. You see them as linear lucencies within the rib. They're easier to see when they're displaced. In particular, you can see here, the right arrow shows a displaced rib fracture. There's another one here. Now, if you have fractures within the first three ribs, this is uncommon because it takes a significant amount of force because those ribs are sandwiched between the clavicle and the scapula. And so this must have been significant force to cause these to be fractured. Additionally, some folks take a look here at the costa vertebral junction and think this must be a fracture. This is actually anatomically correct. This is the cartilage here, and this is the bone here. And this lucency right here is actually the junction between that cartilage and the bone. Now we hear the term flail chest, and oftentimes we don't really know what that means. So depending on the definition that you read, typically it is two or more fractures present in more than three contiguous ribs. You can see here that there are multiple rib fractures coming down along this individual's left ribs. On this rib right here, you have more than one fracture on the same rib. This is not a flail chest, however, it doesn't take away from the severity and pain of this individual having multiple rib fractures. Along with this, you can have pulmonary contusions from these ribs being broken, both with the flail chest and with 
rib fractures. So I wanted to get a good picture of what a flail chest looks like. Here you can see a fracture here and here in the third rib, and the fourth rib there and there, fifth and sixth. Now you have more than three fractures, more than one fracture within the same rib, and this is in fact a flail chest. Additionally, you have fractures going down into the seventh and eighth rib. This person's going to have a lot of pain and more than likely should be admitted into the ICU for pain control, Q1 vital signs, and for pulmonary toilet. And depending on their age, keeping track of their ability to breathe. Pulmonary contusion. This is an individual who had a supine chest x-ray. This patient was struck by a car. And if you look here, you see this patchy, ill-defined opacity in the peripheral right mid-lung. And then additionally, there are some fractures within, within these ribs. This is a pulmonary contusion. In some individuals, in certain populations that will come in with trauma, particularly pediatric population, they don't have to have fractures in order for them to have a pulmonary contusion. This is because children's rib cages tend to be more pliable there's a little bit more cartilage and a little bit for, more forgiveness within the, the ribs themselves, and you can still have bruising of the lung without an actual fracture. So pneumothorax. There are several different kinds of pneumothorax. The most common is the traumatic pneumothorax. This comes from penetrating injuries, typically. Um, if not, also a laceration of the tracheobronchial tree, as in when you have rib fractures, or a penetrating wound like a gunshot or a knife wound coming from the outside in, central line placements, thoracocentesis, percutaneous needle biopsies, all of which can perforate the lung and cause air to be trapped into the pleural space. There are also primary spontaneous pneumothoraxes. These can happen without any sort of trauma, particularly within young, tall, thin individuals that oftentimes it runs in the family, and these are caused by blebs or boule that burst. Secondary spontaneous pneumothorax, these happen suddenly with an increase in thoracic pressure, and mostly because individuals might have COPD, asthma, valsalva maneuvers, childbirth. Occasionally within mechanical ventilation, the patient might have aberrant anatomy. More commonly with mechanical ventilation, you'll have individuals that will have a tension pneumothorax. These are most often iatrogenic on ventilated patients, and you end up with a check valve pleural defect. Air goes in but can't come out. It'll manifest itself as tachypnea, tachycardia, cyanosis, hypotension, and the chest x-ray would show a hemithorax expanded or a hyperlucency with medically retracted lung. So here's an example of what a pneumothorax looks like here. You'll see this line running across the right hand side very faintly. These are difficult to see. This is a left-sided apical pneumothorax. And note also, too, there are several fractures within the ribs here that show up and are to cause this pneumothorax. Sulcosine. Sulcosine can be a clue that you have a pneumothorax. Now, you can have a pneumothorax without a sulcosine. However, if you have one, typically this is because you have a pneumothorax. So here, I wish they had shown bilaterally the costophrenic angles but this is a no normal costophrenic angle. When you compare the costophrenic angle here, this side has increased now. This is the same patient. You can see the lung edge here and lung markings that don't go into this space here. And then you see the increase of the costophrenic angle. It's widened more. And the lung itself has started to collapse. And you can see the lung edge here. And then you see a mediastinal shift to the left. Choice of position. How much air does it take for a pneumothorax to show up on chest x-ray? So lateral decubitus could take as little as 5 cc's of air. Upright, as little as 50 cc's of pleural gas. And supine, this is the most common chest x-ray that we do in the hospital. Basically, the patient is laying flat on their back. You end up having as much as half a liter of pleural gas before it can be seen on a chest x-ray. So size of pneumothorax can be measured several different ways. In particular, the British Thoracic Society says that a small pneumothorax is less than 2 centimeters from the chest wall to the visceral pleural line. 
and a large pneumothorax is two centimeters or greater from that same measurement. There is an additional way that is very, fairly creative called light's index. I used two arbitrary numbers here and measured from the mediastinum to the chest wall. And you can see here that there's an edge to the lung and no lung markings past this area. So I measured from the mediastinum to the lung edge and that was 13. And I measured from the mediastinum to the chest wall and that was 15. When I inputted those two measurements, L cubed and H cubed times 100%, I got an estimated pneumothorax of 34%. What is not a pneumothorax? Skin folds. How did they show up? Just like this. So we push boards underneath individuals during traumas in order to get a picture of them if they have loose skin across their back. Oftentimes that will fold over or sometimes it'll be clothing underneath them that will give what looks like a line here. And what you need to do is take a look and see if the lung markings move out past that line. If they do, in fact, this is not a pneumothorax. This is some sort of skin fold. Sometimes the scapulae can appear to be a pneumothorax. And really what you're looking for is a continuous line that runs all the way down the lung. No lung markings past that line and sometimes a mediastinal shift.